Hello. Now you mention a Christmas carol to a lot of people and you'll see a very indulgent smile wrap itself across their face as their eyes go dewy and soft. And they'll say, oh yes, yes, that lovely festive morality tale about the redemption of a heartless miser transformed into a generous, friendly benefactor to the disadvantaged. They might even tell you about the Disney version with Mickey Mouse or what I'm assured is an absolute chuckle fest, the Muppets Christmas Carol. However, I'm not sure that these cinematic interpretations of Dickens' novella can do justice to one of the money shots of Victorian literature. The emergence from the Ghost of Christmas Present's robe of ignorance and want. Two chillingly crafted little critters designed to provoke fear and pity in the reader in equal measure. Now you'll recall from the novella, stage three, that the Ghost of Christmas Present basically injects joy into people's lives over Christmas and defers the misery of Victorian poverty. But he can only do this for one day. He's got a 24-hour life cycle. After that, he dies and poverty re-emerges from the shadows to smother people's existences. And to appreciate Dickens' mastery of structure in this scene, I'm going to take you back, not to 1842, when the novella was written, but to 1980, when, shortly after the birth of one of the finest English teachers to ever grace the YouTube stage, a slasher movie was wowing him at the box office called Friday the 13th. Now, very near to the end of this movie, Alice, the final girl, the survivor, she's defeated the swivel-eyed loon with the big knife that's trying to kill all the campers, She's the sole survivor and she's enjoying a moment's peace on the lake. And all is light and tranquility. Uh, the water's like a sheet of glass. Lush trees gently sway behind her as she trails her fingers idly in the water. I think some classical music might play. Anyway, she's just sharing with the audience her relief in surviving. And then this ugly critter lunges out of the water grabs our Alice and drags her down to the murky depths, utterly shattering that pleasant, peaceful scene. Well, that was a lovely little wander down movie memory lane, Mr Taylor. Maybe now you tell me what it's got to do with ignorance and want. Well, what makes the appearance of ignorance and want so shocking, above and beyond Dickens' fantastic description of them, is the fact that their appearance is preceded by this pleasant atmosphere born of the hijinks of the house party. We, the reader, Scrooge and Christmas, the ghost of Christmas present, have watched Topper and Fred and the gang whooping it up like goodens at the house party. In fact, such was the infectious joy of the party that even Scrooge appears to be enjoying himself. And we're seeing a real thawing of his coldness, aren't we? We're seeing embryonic signs of the new Scrooge, that Scrooge 2.0, that warmer, kinder specimen of humanity. To clarify then, Dickens' structural mastery in this scene hinges on contrast. He's created a warm, pleasant mood for the reader through the party. Therefore, it's more of a shock when these two horrible, haggard children are unleashed on us straight afterwards. Here's an extract from that chilling scene. I'm just going to lock in on the details I've highlighted in green to get an idea of how Dickens is crafting language and structure to create his effects. On this first line, the spirit says that the children's hand might be a claw for all the flesh there is upon it. Two ways we can interpret this line. First of all, it looks like a claw because the child is so malnourished. Uh, an index or a measure of the grinding poverty that compels children to skip meals. Also, though, claw has connotations of like an animal or an eagle, you know, an apex predator. So there's a sense that this... This thing, this child, has got quite a predatory, dangerous element to it. Another thing Dickens does here is to heap up or list several adjectives to describe these children. First of all, we've got wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. Not only is this painting a picture of this child's faults, but I guess that listing is just conveying the, the volume, the sheer number of flaws and it simultaneously evokes fear and pity in the children. 
Similarly, you've got the fact later on that they're described as yellow, meagre, ragged, scowling, wolfish. Again, that listing to emphasise the, the scale or the number of flaws that they have. Yellow, they've got this kind of sickly aura about them. Again, poverty is almost a disease that drains them. And again, we've got that wolfish, which links in the claw. These are dangerous children. Poverty has made them something for you to fear. There's a strong sense in this description that poverty deforms or corrupts innocence, corrupts youth. Um, it says that they appear to be pinched and twisted, two words with painful associations. Poverty has damaged these children. It's made them look ugly. It's hurt them and pulled them into shreds. A great metaphor for the idea that poverty destroys lives. And where angels might have sat enthroned, devils lurked. These children are now a dangerous prospect because of the, the physical, the psychological damage that poverty has inflicted. The ghost says, doesn't he, fear both of these children, but most of all fear ignorance because on his brow, doom is written. In other words, civilization, society is going to crumble if we don't address the problem of ignorance. Ignorance perpetuates poverty. And this is Dickens on his soapbox. This is Dickens promoting the idea that education is vital to defeating ignorance. Education, of course, gives people the opportunity to escape poverty. You get better skill set, more knowledge that's going to earn you better money and drag you out of the gutter. Education then, defeating ignorance and by extension, defeating poverty. But let's not forget, ignorance refers to Scrooge. Yes, this man is educated, but Scrooge is ignorant of the true causes of poverty. He naively attributes it to the, the failings of the poor, their idleness or their incompetence. As soon as he realises that he is instrumental in the plight of the poor, once that ignorance is addressed, that is going to help reduce the incidence of poverty. Here we are, folks. End of the line. Conclusions. Ignorance and want, want meaning poverty or lack of something, are only contained for one day, whilst the ghost of Christmas present spreads festive joy to all, regardless of wealth. Dickens' use of structure maximises the reader's shock when these characters appear. In a sense, the reader's been enrolled into a false sense of security, because the scene immediately before it is such a joyous one at Fred's party. Through a list of adjectives describing the two deformed children, Dickens evokes a mixture of pity and horror in his readers. And finally, through the horrifying young figures, ignorance and want, the ghost echoes Dickens' belief on the vital role of education in combating poverty. That's education in the sense of equipping the poor with the skills to earn more money, but also addressing the ignorance of people like Scrooge, who believe that poverty is a self-inflicted injury. And there you have it, folks. Ignorance and want. Two creepy kids designed to scare the bejingo out of you, me and Scrooge.